Good afternoon and welcome to Africa.com's Crisis Management for African Business Leaders. My name is Soko Sibia from Africa.com. At this point, it is my pleasure to introduce Africa.com Chairman and CEO, Teresa Clark. Much so Thank you. Good. Well, welcome. We are very excited to start the third part of the series on crisis management for African business leaders. Um, today, we'd like to start by thanking um, all of the people who have made this series possible. This is our 11th webinar in this series. And we'd like to start by thanking um, all of the faculty from Harvard Business School who have made this session um, what it is. And so we've had the pleasure of working with six members of the faculty from Harvard Business School. And we'd like to thank Hakeem Bella Osagi, Professor Carolyn Elkins, Professor Hill, I should say Professor Hakeem Bella Osagi, let me make sure I say that properly. Uh, Professor Linda Hill, Professor Tarun Khanna, Professor Andy Zalecki, and Professor David Wilkins of Harvard Law School for their assistance in developing the content that we have been bringing to you. We'd also like to thank our lead sponsor, Standard Bank, for their steadfast commitment to our program from the very beginning and all throughout today. Um, today, we're looking at those digital trends that are, have come about as a result of COVID-19. We're looking at those digital trends that have uh, have been helpful in helping all of us to survive in the current new normal. But we recognize that these digital trends are not likely to leave um, once we resolve COVID-19. These trends are likely to be here for a long time and to stay. Um, and so we put together a wonderful panel of people who are at the forefront of all of these trends. Um, we have a moderator who is Dio Olapade, who heads partnerships for Google in France, and she is the author of The Bright Continent, a book that has explored Africa's leapfrog in, leapfrogging in technology, and she has traveled the continent exploring the same sorts of digital trends that we are looking at today, and so we are in very able hands um, as we uh, work with Dio to tackle this topic today. In addition, we have a, just an all-star uh, set of panelists, starting with Dr. Fumi Adewara, who's the founder of, uh, and CEO of Mobile Health International. She's gonna talk to us about telemedicine and how telemedicine has taken a leap forward during this time. Mark Elliott, who is a division president of MasterCard Southern Africa, is going to talk to us about how contactless payments have grown tremendously during this time as a, both a um, way to stay safe, but also a greater convenience for African consumers. We have Makana Musidi, who's the Chief Information Officer at Standard Bank, who's gonna to talk to us about how banks have changed and how banks are serving their customers better and how they are using technology to provide a better consumer journey. Ned Desmond is with us. Ned is the COO of TechCrunch, the leading magazine in Silicon Valley that follows trends primarily in the U.S. and he's going to be giving us some perspective on how all of these trends are taking place in the U.S. and what else he is seeing from his very unique vantage point. Thank you very much for joining us today, Ned. We have Wamboro Kiminu, who is the CEO of Inesa Education. She's going to be talking to us about EdTech and as Africa has shut down its schools, how is Africa surviving? Are the students getting what they need from distance learning? We know there's some challenges, but she's going to talk to us not only about the challenges, but the successes that are taking place in that space. And finally, we have Alyssa Pretorius, who is the head of Uber Eats for Sub-Saharan Africa. And Alyssa is going to talk to us about something that we've all probably experienced, and that is ordering our food in uh, during this time and how that has grown and what she sees as the future trends for Uber Eats. So we are really excited to have really brought together a set of panelists who are attacking this from an ed tech, a health tech, from a banking, payments, um, food delivery, and then a global perspective uh, from the COO of TechCrunch. So with no further ado, I'm going to step aside and hand the reins over to our very able moderator, Daya Olapade. Um, Daya, thank you very much. Good morning, afternoon, and good night, depending on where you are. Thank you so much, Teresa, for that comprehensive introduction, very thorough, and congrats on establishing such a vital pipeline for information to business leaders during, I think, what we're all calling these unprecedented times. Um, they will pass, trends may endure, um, and I think this is a great time to, to convene what appears to be a very interdisciplinary conversation around the future the near future and the distant future for Africa. Um, as you have mentioned, this is a space that I've spent many years thinking about, talking about, arguing about, learning about, building within. 
Um, and I'm really excited to have the opportunity to have a dialogue, not just with my co-panelists, um, but also with the audience. Um, thank you for taking the time to be with Africa.com today and with all of us. Um, I will not go on for too long, but I did thought it would, I did think that it would be constructive to set out just some parameters for, at least within the media situation that I find myself working in, um, we have seen a lot of change as a result of COVID-19. Um, and then we'll kick it open to questions and, and presentations from each of the panelists in turn. Um, so, you know, welcome to my home. Everyone is sheltering in place or working from home, depending on where you are in the world. Um, but I think one key theme that I've observed in this time of uh, global pandemic is a theme of connection and real simultaneity at the same time that we're seeing disconnection and a lot of fragmented responses. Um, time was, you could imagine a world where everyone is experiencing everything at the same time, where the internet has flattened borders, where people don't care whether you're, you know, in, in Zambia um, or in East Asia or in Silicon Valley. And I think what's interesting about the COVID response, which has been largely national, is you have seen a turn away from that connectivity promised by the internet, where you're not just having, you know, now you have a United Kingdom response, or you have an American response, or a Brazilian response, or a Nigerian response, um, which is against the mega trend that I've observed, which is one of simultaneous flattening of borders. So that's something I had not expected, something maybe I had been wrong about, and something I'd love for us all to think about as we, we respond to the different prompts and conversations, as we hear from different industries, um, the question of whether we are in this together or whether we are in this apart, and the role of tech in all of that. Um, what we are definitely sure about is that consumer behaviors have been completely changed, um, not just in Africa, but globally by this pandemic. And I'll, I'll give you a couple of key points just from the domain of media again to be more concrete in what I mean when I say people's uses of the internet have changed. So um, for two and a half years I ran YouTube's business in Africa and we saw people come to the YouTube platform for all kinds of reasons. People came to learn, people came um, to be entertained. In the last four or five months we've actually seen a change in those behaviors. Um, there are four big things that people have started to come to, to watch from media in this moment. Firstly, a lot of it is on demand um, because it's not possible to go to a movie theater or go to a live concert or go and experience the world in real time. Um, and so we've seen an uptick in engagement with video on demand. And in, within video on demand, there's four big categories that have emerged in terms of how people are using our platform. The first is for news. This is a moment with fast moving information, lots of uncertainty, and a real thirst from individuals, wherever they are, to know exactly what is going on. And so credible, authoritative sources of information are paramount. Now obviously Google search results, YouTube search results can deliver that to people when they're trying to understand the latest on symptoms, the latest on treatment, the latest on their government's local response to this crisis. So that has been one of the top reasons why people turn to tech platforms is to get credible information. The second is actually more in the realm of spiritualism and well-being. I'm sure all of us in month two, three, four, or maybe even five of a stay-at-home situation have started to find a little bit of fraying around the edges of um, you know, how we stay grounded, how we stay sane. <laughs> and so people have turned to our platforms to look for um, religious content, to look for um, um, act activities, for example, like exercise at home, um, to meditate, um, to find comfort and, and other kind of spiritual and well-being types of content um, that are delivering for them on demand an experience they might have had in their community or engaging with other people. Um, and so we've seen a real uptick in interest from consumers in media that speaks to well-being. The third area is the sort of classic of, of YouTube, and I think one of the benefits of the World Wide Web at large, which is the category of how and DIY. 
Now, in my time, you know, running a business uh, focused on YouTube in Africa, but over the years as a user myself, it's been a place where you can figure out how to do pretty much anything <laughs> if you just type in the words. People are learning to cook. People are learning to make masks. People are learning, you know, uh, gardening. People are learning trade skills. And I think what's particularly interesting in the African context is that there is a, a culture and a tradition in many different countries of artisanship and apprenticeship that for the most part has been taking place someone side by side, teaching a craft, teaching a trade. What's really remarkable, and I hope we can come to this when we speak about education technology, is that apprenticeship and the time spent really learning how to make a shoe, how to make a bag, how to fix a car, how to fix these types of things that was transmitted person to person in an unscalable way for decades and generations in Africa is now actually something that you might be able to learn online from a visual reference and someone talking you through it. Um, and I think that's one of the main reasons why the DIY and how-to category remains something I'm very excited about um, for the future of, of Africa and for media in general. So that's been a big category under stay-at-home lockdown, um, is people just trying to figure out how they can improve themselves, how they can learn a new skill, reskill, or, or transmit knowledge, whether it's learning a language, a spoken one, or a programming one, or learning how to build something new, um, whether a dish or um, some kind of material object. And the last category is pure entertainment. And this is where I have come in, um, in sort of bridging my new and, and past role, is um, that people are looking for content to be diverted, whether it's kids content to keep um, young people entertained when they're not in schools, or whether it's um, catching up with favorite films, streaming music, um, otherwise finding ways to replace, again, the real life experiences they might have had if we were not in this lockdown situation. Um, and so the, especially with the absence of live sport that is only just now starting to come back as part of the, the TV, traditional TV experience, you have seen people um, searching on demand for films, old clips of, of sports highlights that they love, um, music videos that, that bring them joy, um, and of course, these kinds of um, engagements over um, live streams. Um, YouTube, I think, should should take credit and has gotten some some great feedback for organizing a wonderful benefit concert on Africa Day, um, which was in late May, and I hope many of you caught it, um, featuring some of the continent's biggest stars, um, global talent, um, again, using the platform to take um, stories from Africa to a global audience. So again, to run through those categories of how media is changing under COVID, we have news, you have spiritualism and well-being, you have how-to and DIY, and you have pure entertainment. All of which I think contribute to people's understanding of um, how the internet can change and adapt to respond to the needs of the moment. And I'll leave you with a general thought about how I'm thinking about whether these trends will yeah. endure or whether these trends will be temporary. Um, that's one axis, right? These consumer behaviors that are temporary versus consumer behaviors that are durable and which, and we'll talk a lot about where we sit on that spectrum between the two. But then going back to my earliest point, the things that we're gonna do together and the things that we're gonna do apart and where these different behaviors um, are gonna converge as a kind of global trend or be something that is invented, you know, whole cloth in a very local way. Um, and those are the two big axes that I'm thinking about across all of these different disciplines. Um, and ideally we'll be able to get into the meat um, of how, how these industries are changing um, across those, those different axes. So without further ado, I will wrap up this kind of introductory remarks um, and turn it over um, for a poll um, that I think Soku is going to help share with us. And then we'll get into questions from, for each of our panelists. To what degree do you agree with the following statement? I have increased my digital consumption habits over the last three months. This could be food delivery, online movies, the use of Zoom. We're all on Zoom now, so I think maybe that might have increased. 96% of the people agree with that statement. 2% neither agree nor disagree. And 1% disagree. We'll move to the next question. How has the digital divide in your country changed over the last three months? 
So the digital gap between the have and the have nots. Has the gap narrowed? Has the gap remained the same? Or has the gap increased? So the gap has increased, 46% of the people have said. Let's load the next question. Do you think that COVID-19 has propelled Africa forward in terms of use of digital technologies? So 93% say yes, and 7% say no. That is the end of the poll, thank you. All right, I thought that was very illuminating actually. Um, obviously we have a very digital audience here, given that we're all on a uh, virtual conference um, discussion, but, um, not a lot of controversy. I think everyone is agreeing that the, the digital situation has been a lifeline, I think, for many people who are trying to maintain some sense of continuity and, and order in the way that they are conducting their business and conducting their lives. Um, but again, it, it does divide into a, a matter of people who have access and people who don't. Um, and that when we speak about the internet, we're still speaking only about a fraction of the world's population. And in Africa, those divides can be very real. Um, so thank you for that thought thoughtful poll to ground us in a sense of who we're speaking to and um, what general consensus there is um, about, about how COVID has impacted um, the, the continent. Um, I will pass now um, to hear from Mark um, who I believe Teresa gave a brief introduction to, but um, who I think will provide us some really useful and illuminating insights from the world of payments, <laughs> transactions, um, and MasterCard. I have, I have personally spoken with and for the, the MasterCard Foundation over the years, greatly admired the work you were doing in Africa, and very excited not just to hear from you, but then to open up a dialogue around um, this fascinating area of, of very rapid change on the continent. Um, so I will leave it to you. I believe you have slides. Um, and then we can, I'll come up with a few questions and we can just chat about after the fact. How's that? That's great. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, it's really a pleasure to be here um, uh, this afternoon. So, I mean, I, I think that the the question probably on everybody's mind is, uh, so how is, um, how is COVID and how has the virus really affected uh, people's behavior um, when, it comes to, when it comes to payments? And um, I guess that's, that's an opportunity for me to share some insights this afternoon um, around uh, what we've seen at MasterCard. Um, and uh, let's see where we get to that. I'm excited to hear how this plays against the interplay between the different industries from the speakers. Um, so, you know, the, the, the really interesting thing is that if you think about who is actually spending at the moment um, in the world of payments, there are, there are two distinct groups. You've got, um, you've got your consumers uh, and you've also, you also got um, a really important group, which is your, your SMEs. Um, and those are two, two, two focus areas for us at MasterCard. Um, and I guess, you know, it's probably affecting each group very differently. Um, but with that backdrop, uh, before we came into um, the, the most recent situation, whereby 85% of the world's transactions are still in cash, believe it or not. Um, and in Africa, we're looking at 90% uh, plus across the whole of Africa is still in cash. So the question then is, if you've got that cash society um, and uh, you, know, you want to deal with some of the challenges which a, a virus presents, what are the types of changes that we've seen amidst that? And I guess it's affecting the different groups uh, in different ways. Um, the, the, um, you know, the, the everyday consumer is looking for safer ways to pay um, and looking to um, ensure that they can uh, you know, think about how to transact maybe in a different way. And I'll come on and talk more about that. But then you've got the SME who's trying to run a business. Um, and is, is really thinking through that if, if cash is maybe, you know, perceived as, as more, you know, not as hygienic as it was in the past, um, do I need to now embrace digital means? And by embracing digital means, um, what does that mean for, um, you know, the way in which I, I, I conduct transactions? Um, and, and how am I going to be able to manage my cash flow? Um, you know, I've got, I've got things I need to pay for during my day. And if I'm, Embracing digital means, is it going to be so easy to manage that cash flow through a digital environment as it was in the old physical environment? Um, and, and indeed, 
things like fraud and cybersecurity. How am I going to be able to handle payments um, in that new digital world that uh, I need to embrace if I want to you know, have a more, I guess, acceptable way to conduct my business in the eyes of, in the eyes of my customers? So those are the challenges. Um, and uh, I think what we've seen is just a tremendous um, um, shift throughout the pandemic in terms of the way that we've seen behavior adjust. And what I can share with you is that at a, at a Middle East Africa level, um, just to throw some stats around, um, we've actually seen that in the month of May itself, about 50% of transactions have been in the e-commerce uh, area, right? Um, and, uh, and that's up from about a third before. So tremendous recognition that you know online payments and when we talk about online payments it's important to remember that it's it's not just um you know the browser type online payments it, it can be through the, the mobile phone uh, using um you know the different ways that we can access the internet um and I, I guess what's what's also kind of a real shift is then that people are attending to want to shop online and um and also embracing a a different way of, 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 of conducting that, that shopping. Um, so, and that's had an effect, let's, let's be honest. It's, uh, it's exposed some of those uh, bigger uh, retailers who potentially haven't been equipped to deal with um, that surge of online demand. Um, and uh, we've seen some uh, significant retailers shift and, and adapt to that um, pretty quickly, but it's not easy for everybody to, to make that shift. And so that's a, you know, that demand though does, does place quite a lot of onus on that. So just in terms of, you know, we've done some research uh, probably about a month ago now. And, and what that did was it showed us that um, the consumer, so back to one of those, those groups I was talking about earlier, has really um, changed their behavior. Um, and what the research showed us was that um, customers are now seeking out um, a place where they can conduct contactless payments. So they're looking for a place where they've got that symbol, where they can ensure that they've maybe got a, a safer way to pay, um, a more hygienic way to pay, um, and uh, a little bit more discretionary in the way that they are shopping. Um, and if you've got that symbol, that contactless symbol on one of the cards in your wallet, then potentially that card becomes almost top of wallet. Um, and so, you know, in the past, we've always talked about top of wallet cards being maybe the one that gets you into the air, airport lounge, allows you to maybe have a benefit or a perk that um, you, know, you thought was, was really important to you in your own personal lifestyle, maybe a bit of cash back at point of sale, for example. Um, but now it's, it's actually, it's about having that safer way to pay. And, and that has provided a, a different way of looking at, um, at contact, contactless. Um, I think why that's interesting is because um, what we're going to see is, a, is an adoption uh, of, of customers of that contactless way to pay. And um, what I can share with you is that in the month we conducted the research, um, 13 times um, higher expenditure year on year was actually on those uh, contactless transactions. So a huge shift in terms of customer behavior. They tend to be on transactions you know, around the um, $25 mark, below the $25 mark. So displacing a lot of cash, um, which, um, you know, smaller ticket items, which uh, people are happy to, to tap and go with. Um, but, you know, a real shift in terms of customer behavior. But let's not stop there. And I think it's really important to recognize that when we talk about contactless payments, it's not necessarily about just the card form factor. Uh, what we're seeing increasingly is that people are spending more time on their, their phones and um, they are you know, doing a variety of different things, but they're also looking at how they can pay with their, their mobile phone. And so we're starting to see that customers are thinking through what are the options they've got to do those kind of contactless payments? Um, is it with a card or is it potentially something that I can do with my phone? Um, or is it indeed a, a wearable, you know, a Garmin or a Fitbit? Is that, a, is that another form factor which I can use? And potentially that could be another way to pay. So it's, it's creating a habit and in payments, um, habits are good if they're, if they're displacing cash and, 
um, doing things which are helping people's lifestyle and improving their consumer experiences, which is really what we obsess about. Um, and, uh, and, and I think that's the change we're making. Um, I think just then to, um, to kind of round off on, 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 on this first initial um, question around um, the change in, in contactless payments, I think it's just important to recognize that what I've spoken about so far is really on the, um, on the customer side. But there also need to be um, more contactless options on the on the acceptance side as well. And so the change I guess we're seeing is that a significant shift in terms of um, innovation. And when I say innovation, I mean shift away from the traditional, slightly more expensive point of sale machines to a proliferation of, of QR, QR codes, um, which um, we've seen significant growth in terms of QR codes in the last three months. Um, you know, I, I can tell you that they've grown probably 25% um, in South Africa, just as one example. Um, and, uh, you know, I think we're seeing almost a ubiquity of, um, of QR as an acceptance form. And therefore, you know, people really need to think through how they're going to continue to differentiate and continue to innovate around QR. Um, and also, um, you know, other types of ways of acceptance. So, Ned Bank in, um, you know, just released um, again in South Africa, a um, tap, on, tap on phone or tap on glass as we call it, so that somebody can actually do a contactless payment onto a telephone, um, which is actually, if you think about it, an either cheap, even cheaper way of, if the, if the merchant already has a mobile phone and that mobile phone can turn itself into a point of sale device, then that's another way of actually facilitating a payment on the merchant side. So a lot of innovation on the on the merchant side, and some real changes in terms of customer behaviour. Um, so it's a massive shift, and uh, I guess at Mastercard we believe that these shifts are here to stay. So that's the uh, I guess the first thematic I thought I'd share Sharing with you. Sharing that, I think it's really interesting one? for me to hear the, the pace of innovation and the speed with which people are adapting. And and thank you for bringing in the SME layer because I think. You know, we talk a lot about person-to-person -person payments, wallets being used for savings, but I think that the layer of merchants who are maybe more nimble and more able to sort of experiment and deploy um, are those that maybe are best positioned to take the benefits of um, a transition to more digital transactions and, and e-commerce. Um, my question for you, as originally framed, was kind of thinking about this question of durability of, of these this habits. Um, obviously something like a QR code um, is actually a more permanent type of infrastructural change. And it's really interesting to see that that, that having been accelerated by the, the COVID environment may actually just now become part of the furniture in the way that merchants interact with their consumers. Um, but the behavior that you also alluded to, where people are just a little bit more scared <laughs> um, to touch things, seems like it might go either way. It might be something that lasts for many years or is done by the time we've got a vaccine, fingers crossed. Um, do, you, do you place these other innovations you've talked about, like where would you put them on the spectrum of things that are really going to be part of the furniture, and regulated and part of how we go forward, versus things that might be more flash in the pan? I'd love to hear you talk about some of those things you mentioned is on that on that spectrum. Sure. So, thanks. I mean, I think the 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 great thing is um, is uh, we we we've we've recognised that there's some global mega trends around uh, not only the speed of the transaction but also around the consumer experience, and so um, and also obviously the way in which we we tend to spend a lot of our time, which is on our mobile phones. So. Um, there has been a, a real strategic intent um, about how we can industrialize, I suppose, um, you know, with our, our, our customers, um, different types of experiences for the benefit of customers. And what I mean by that is that um, ultimately, you know, if you're thinking about a mobile phone and you want to make a payment, um, the mobile phone on its own can't make a payment. It needs to be able to um, be established in such a way so that it can tap on a point of sale device, for example. And that's why things like tokenization, where you secure the credentials um, of, the, of, the, um, of the customer 
um, at that moment of truth when you make a payment and tap the telephone on the point of sale device is really critical. So tokenization is a great example of how you industrialize these types of payment shifts. Um, I think also, you know, we need to think more broadly about different segments. So, you know, if somebody wants to use a wearable because they're a fitness fanatic, and um, then we have to think about how we tokenize those types of devices. Because ultimately, as we know, as we go into the world of Internet of Things and every device becomes a device of commerce, ultimately these devices need to be able to talk to each other and, um, and, and make payments. So tokenization is, is, is terribly important. I think the other, the other area which is, which is really interesting is, coming back to the SME for a second, is how can we um, you know, think about uh, within these environments, elevating um, the SME. Um, and by that, what I mean is, um, how can we think about making, availing credit, for example, um, you know, for exercising the right type of behavior. So a great example of that is some work we've done in Africa um, with KCB and Unilever, where effectively we've taken the, the retail data, if you like, based on um, you know, inventory management and we've, we've cross-tabulated that with MasterCard data and, you know, a, a provide that back to um, the partner bank, in, in this case, KCB, and, you know, allows them to make a more informed decision around um, lending, i.e. credit uh, lending to, to, to the SME. So there are some really interesting innovations around um, how, we can, how we can become more, more relevant um, and, and how we can actually elevate um, society and make it more inclusive um, for, for all of those that are participating. Yeah, so uh, thank you for that. Really helpful to hear your gloss. Um, I'm tempted to, to talk to you about hardware and the different kinds of devices. I mean, you mentioned something like a wearable. That feels very far afield for the sort of long tail of consumers in Africa. Um, but it's very possible that you may see these sort of large scale movements to provide government identity cards that then could also be embedded with some kind of um, near field communication technology that would allow people to, at scale, kind of engage um, with hardware that, that allows them to transact. Um, but I guess I want to move maybe then to my other axis, <laughs> which is looking at our, is this a local, local or a global phenomenon? Um, is this something where we're going to see individual micro um, ecosystems sprint ahead or leapfrog to use the term I use in my book? Um, or will we see a kind of mass migration towards these new forms of interaction that just seems obvious as a transition? I will bring up as someone who grew up in the United States, spent years working and living in Africa and now lives in the United Kingdom, even the idea of contactless payments varies so widely that I'm tempted to say it's all going to be very local. Um, you know, I had one of the very first M-Pesa accounts, and, but even now interoperability is very difficult for mobile payments uh, on the continent. So do you foresee some of these changes being incubated in small pockets and then expanded as a best practice or a new norm? Or will we see just a, a wholesale change in the way people do business, frankly, due to this disease? So I, I, think, I think what we're seeing is that uh, there's a, um... There's a couple of different plays at hand here, and so what you have is you have the, um, you know, you have the the eastern example of the um, the super app, uh, which we see um, in the likes of China, um, and then um, you know in, in 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 the likes of America, maybe more towards the west, uh, we have the likes of um, you know the Apple pays and, and and the Samsung pays, right? And so I think, you know, to answer your question at, a, at an academic level, um, almost, um, I think Africa has to choose its route, has to choose its path. Um, and I, I don't think that necessarily has been chosen yet. What I, what I do see, um, which is really um, exciting, is that you have um, some very active MNOs um, who are thinking about how they can uh, broaden the touch points and relationships that they have with their, their, their customer bases. Um, and then you also have um, some, obviously, lots of banks. Um, and then you've got a really exciting fintech community. So, and, and, and a lot of them want to embrace payments as part of that, uh, that strategy, uh, potentially to enable things like what you spoke about, i.e., you know, streaming of video content, for example, um, or potentially to, you know, get into availing credit. So I think 
to answer your question, you know, MasterCard's role amidst all of that is enablement. Um, and, and what we're looking to do really is to, um, you know, to drive what I would call a multi-rail strategy, whereby at that moment of truth, when a customer wants to make a payment, they can pull from their mobile money wallet or they can pull from their, uh, their bank account or indeed from their card and facilitate a payment at that QR code or indeed you know, whatever they require to do. I think we're early in the journey and that's why um, I say that we need to choose our path and then get behind it. Um, you know, when you talk about interoperability, we know that things like remittance are some of the most expensive corridors on the continent. And, uh, you know, we need to find better ways and easier ways for those that need to send money around the continent to be able to do it more affordably. Um, so I think there's a lot of work to do, quite frankly, to really come to a truly multi-rail environment where you have, um, you know, quicker means of payment so that as an SME, when somebody pays me money, it actually shows up in my wallet relatively quickly. Um, but it's an exciting journey. And I, I think um, it's kind of in Africa's hands to decide how they're going to take it forward. Thank you for that. We are going to move on, I think, to the next speaker. But I just wanted to add something interesting that I found as someone who has taken advantage of the analog remittance economy, where people are just flying from country to country or traveling from one place to another. This is an interesting second order effect, which I think is a trend I hope will come back to for all of the speakers. If the first order effect of COVID was to end travel, second order effect is to compromise remittances <laughs> and to compromise the kind of informal um, courier services of, of various diasporas of the world. So I do think that there is something important to, to discuss there when it comes to the relationship between economically challenged um, uh, advanced economies and economically challenged lean economies in Africa, um, where everyone's kind of knocked on their on their back, and we need to figure out how to reconstitute these very intricate um, dependencies between societies. And obviously, payments is a big part of that. So, um, hopefully, this will keep coming up. I'm being asked to keep moving on, but thank you so much, Mark. That was insightful. I learned a lot. Now I'm just I'm all about QR codes now, um, and look forward <laughs> to bringing you back in if we get some time at the end of this. Thank you. So next we will have uh, Dr. Fumi Adewara. Thank you for your, uh, your time. I know you have um, some, some slides to share with the audience. I hope you guys are all hanging in there. This is fascinating for me and I hope you're having as much fun as I am. Um, Fumi is the CEO and founder of Moby Health, as you can see on screen. And will talk to us a little bit about the evolution of medicine and health services on the continent during this difficult time. Take it away. Thank you, Dario. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here. Um, so COVID has disrupted our lives in very uh, unprecedented, unprecedented manner and uh, there have been different uh, responses across Africa uh, within the general population as well as the medical community. Uh, the initial lockdown and um, the restriction of movement prevented people from accessing healthcare. Uh, so um, we had different responses within the medical communities you had um, doctors and um, different businesses, private sector responses. People were afraid of going to the hospital and the hospitals were afraid of taking the patient because of the stigmatization and the risk of exposure. So telemedicine itself is not entirely new uh, concept. Uh, it's been in existence for decades. However, the adoption across Africa has been really slow before COVID. Uh, for various reasons from technical barriers to lack of awareness and to, to just the general um, uh, preference towards an inpatient visit uh, as well as just uh, uh, digital uh, empathy. So uh, telemedicine really at the COVID-19 pandemic has thrown telemedicine to the forefront as a cost-effective solution uh, given that we're talking about medical distancing, uh, social distancing and, and the fear, the genuine fear of contracting COVID has led to change in consumer behavior. And what you find is um, within the general population, people are now warming up to the idea of um, leveraging uh, telemedicine to access healthcare. So Africa, as you know, um, we have a very fragile healthcare system. More than 95% of the 1.3 billion people lack access to basic healthcare, from poor infrastructure to uh, exposure to counterfeit medicines 
and unqualified personnel. But importantly, uh, one of the critical barrier to access is the shortage of doctors. The numbers are very appalling. You, you see here countries like Mozambique having 600, about 694 doctors to a population of 26 million people. Uh, Ethiopia, 3,000 to 115 million people. Uh, Kenya, 7,000 to 46 million people. It's, it's really a very, very terrible situation. If you look at Nigeria, for instance, we have only 72,000 registered doctors, and more than half of us are outside the country. Nine in 10 of those are left behind, are on their way out um, to, to Western countries. So massive brain drain uh, is causing a lot of uh, problems and barrier to, uh, constitutes a fundamental barrier to access today. But telemedicine um, provides an opportunity to bridge the supply gap and can actually help Africa to leapfrog from uh, unsustainable healthcare models to sustainable ones. So you see, you see that um, most of the medical problems can be resolved at primary healthcare level. More than 70% of medical problems can be resolved at primary healthcare level. 60% of medical problems can be resolved via telemedicine. COVID-19 presents a very good opportunity for Africa to leapfrog from not having quality health care now to providing quality health care even at the convenience of the patient's home. We have seen, so Africa has a, I mean, the mobile technology adoption across the continent, the explosive growth of mobile technology presents unique opportunity for this. Nearly half a billion mobile subscribers, 90% mobile penetration in Nigeria. You have 30% smartphone users. Uh, and Africa is not lacking in, in innovators. We have more than 25,000 apps that are being developed across Africa from medication dispensing uh, solutions to um, just use of uh, smartphones to take pictures of um, ophthalmic lesions or eye problems and being forwarded to a doctor remotely to review them. You have medica the, the Matibabu finger clip that helps to um, diagnose malaria with 83% um, accuracy. You have uh, somebody who has developed an, uh, the, a scanner, um, a remote app that can tell you if a medication you're taking is, is, is genuine or not. So these are innovators across Africa. You have mobile clinics that can be deployed to rural areas for, uh, for where there are no healthcare workers. Somebody, now you're able to see five, 10 doctors on the screen at the same time, carrying out 500 to 1,000 consultations. You have the uh, use of drones being used in Rwanda, in Ghana to, to, to dispense blood to rural communities. So we are not lacking in, in, at all in uh, innovation. Now we have developed an integrated solution that enables a patient to do a consultation with a doctor. And our model is basically, um, please go to the next slide. Dr. Fumi, I'm afraid I have to interrupt you here. I think um, I have a question that hopefully you can circle back to some of okay. these things um, and speak to us about the business that you run. Okay. But uh, this was my absolutely one of my very favorite topics to report on when I was working on my book because the breadth and scale of the opportunities to leapfrog in the health sector in Africa are astonishing. Both of my parents are medical doctors trained in Nigeria, and this was my introduction to the continent from a very young age. Um, and it is very amazing to see that even within a cycle of rapid innovation, this new moment has created even further opportunities for us to try things that are not being done elsewhere. Um, I'll bring it back to a question and, and you can carry on and maybe share some of your slide or just answer it as you see fit. I'd like to go back to the behavior piece because that's what's grounding this conversation. The fact that people are in precarious economic Situations. The fact that governments don't necessarily have a safety net of insurance. Insurance as a product, as we've heard from merchants, is still a very new consumer um, idea uh, in many places in Africa. And people are also fearful of going to the hospital because they may contract the disease. Um, how do you think people are growing more comfortable, whether for economic reasons or practical reasons, with engaging with the health sector? Um, or are people still trying to pray things away and try more traditional methods? And, and how is that, how is COVID going to change the behavior of, of trust in these amazing innovations that we are seeing? And how are you working on that topic? So you're absolutely on point. There's a lot of um, distrust, uh, a mistrust um, within the uh, African community. You must, you must have heard about how um, people have been very skeptical about COVID and some saying, no, it doesn't exist. 
uh, and others actually resorting to more local form of um, uh, treatment uh, using different kind of uh, local uh, formularies. So yes, that mistrust does exist. Uh, and also we, the poor adoption of telemedicine across the continent is not just, um, does not just apply to the uh, consumers alone. We also have doctors who, are, who have been very, very slow in adopting telemedicine. But because of the current realities, uh, people are now more um, inclined to leveraging whether it's a phone call or it's a WhatsApp call or a Skype call to, to, to access care. And there's still a lot of work that needs to be done uh, in, in providing access to care. And for primary health care, really, I think, you know, um, like I said, 70% of medical problems can be resolved at primary health care level. Uh, however, the primary health care physicians that you have in most of these primary health centers are doctors who barely have any training, postgraduate training, uh, beyond their initial medical degree. And that is why people defer to tertiary and secondary centers. And that's not cost effective. So we need some sort of restructuring around primary health care that would improve trust in the quality of care that people get. Uh, most people default to chemists and um, pharmacies before they even think of going to the hospital. So COVID-19, the reality is that because of the fear of going to a face-to-face -face consultation, a brick and mortar facility, people are now more willing to try uh, teleconsultation. And, and so we need to build uh, an inclusive product that speaks to the need of all the um, spectrum of um, individuals or health seekers um, so that we can build a more productive, a more inclusive uh, solution that addresses the need and then build trust on that. But yes, yeah, that's a significant uh, barrier to access. Yeah, I think this is very, very important because if people are, if you can reach the layer that is touching the public, whether it's a chemist or a pharmacist or even, I don't know, even if it's in a format like WhatsApp or FaceTime or Zoom that feels more organic, yes. then you can at least get around that big mental challenge of people not wanting to go to a hospital where they fear I'll wait in line all day. There will be a bill. I don't have cash to pay this. I don't trust the system. Um, that's very important. And you um, asked about how we've been able to use our platform to address this. Yeah. So we have built an inclusive product that speaks to both smartphone users and the gen those who have just feature phones. Yeah. So our platform is accessible through smartphones. It's also accessible through toll-free lines as well as telehealth clinics where we can deploy, uh, for instance, mobile clinics or uh, prefabricated containers or just simply plug in to a functional primary health center by just putting a computer or an iPad there and somebody can come into the clinic. You do not need to have any digital skill and you can be connected to a doctor who speaks your language. So we have Hausa, Igbo and mm -hmm. uh, French speaking doctors depending on where you are. So you can be connected to the doctor on the screen and you have um, places, communities where there were no doctors or maybe they have only one doctor and then now they can now speak to doctors on the screen and you can have like 1,000 consultations per day. This is so important. Um, is this happening transnationally? Is this across borders? Is it so possible we, I could have an issue in Nigeria and reach a doctor who's in Zambia? <laughs> that's right. So what we, we, are a pan, we have a Pan-African focus with a global outlook. Nigeria is our entry market, but we're expanding into Kenya, Ghana. We hope to be in half of the continent by 2024. And our solution is integrated. So you do not need to have to, have to go to somewhere else to find your medicine or diagnostic test, not being sure about the quality. So we have um, galvanized all the solution on one portal so that when you have your consultation, we can also give you prescription. We send a prescription ahead of you to the nearest pharmacy. You can get home delivery of your medication and then you can have um, a follow-up plan. If it's beyond teleconsultation, of course, telemedicine does not solve all the problems. It can solve 60%, reduce hospital droppings and all that, but it doesn't solve all the problems. So where you have a situation where a patient needs to go to the for further evaluation, we have partnered with local medical service providers. So we, I think we should continue this conversation, not just because I love, because this is a public health crisis that we're in, um, but because this is an area where um, technology is actually delivering scale and impact. Um, thank you for all of your very important work on this topic. I will continue watching this topic. And if we have um, questions from the audience that relate to this, hopefully we'll get the chance to 
re uh, re engage here. But um, again, many thanks. Um, I'm going to pass the microphone on to uh, Ned Desmond, um, who, as was introduced at the beginning of the call by Teresa, um, where is working with TechCrunch. Um, a global media operation that, again, has its finger on the pulse of technology trends and has done great work in Africa in recent years, um, holding demo days and also covering the business of technology on, in the region. Um, I don't know, Ned, if you have slides, but I will pass to you just to share a bit more about your perspective, maybe what you've learned on this call so far, um, and then we can move on to just some Q&A about um, your perspective on COVID in Africa. Thanks very much, Dio. Um, I'm really delighted to be here. Uh, thank you, Africa.com and Teresa for inviting me. Uh, and congratulations on such a well-produced show. Uh, we're trying to figure these same show formats out at TechCrunch, and I have to say you've done a wonderful job. So uh, thank you very much. So uh, as Dio said at the outset, uh, we really do live in unprecedented times. Uh, they're curious times, they're frightening times. Uh, and before I, I speculate a bit on what that might mean for the startup scene in Africa, uh, I think it's uh, meaningful to set the scene in the United States. <clears throat> we have uh, zero interest rates here effectively. We've spent trillions in government stimulus. We have an outrageous unemployment situation, a continuing COVID crisis and intense political unrest. So uh, it's a little nerve wracking, of course, to be an American these days. <clears throat> I believe that we're looking at the start of an era that will be marked by instability on many fronts. The worst consequences of what's happened in the past four months uh, with COVID and all the rest may take a few years to play out, which is going to really inject a lot of uncertainty into the market. My top fears are inflation, persistent unemployment, worsening inequities on many fronts, which in turn, of course, will lead to more political unrest and potentially strange political outcomes. Uh, I'm also worried about geopolitical unrest, conflict between the US and China in particular. Even if they manage to avoid a real war, which I certainly hope is the case, the tensions between the countries will hurt both economies and the startup scene, uh, like TikTok's difficulties, which I'm sure people are aware of. But right now, from the standpoint of markets, the uh, US is strangely buoyant. The Lemonade IPO was shockingly strong. Tesla's stock price keeps hitting new highs with no real economic justification for that. So obviously there's a lot of froth in the US market. IPOs continue and there's a lot of anticipation around Palantir and Snowflake coming out this summer. Uh, but overall, we're beginning to see a downward trend in some important uh, ways of looking at the numbers. Uh, exits via EPO or acquisition have definitely slowed down in the, uh, versus the prior two years. We're tracking at about uh, half the level of what we saw in 2018 and 2019. And the U.S. Uh, venture investing market is a bit muted. Early stage investments um, are healthy by most accounts. VCs are figuring out how to make bets on founders they have not met in person, which is quite shocking to VCs because they always imagine that so much depends on face-to-face -face contact. Um, but now, uh, in the past couple of months, it's become very macho to, quote, write a check to a founder on the strength of a Zoom meeting or two. Uh, I guess you could say we're entering the era of tele-VC or contactless VC, uh, because that is the only way they can really do business. In any case, uh, there's simply too much competition at the early stage level for investors to sit it out right now. This is a trend to watch, I think, especially from the standpoint of founders outside the U.S. who are interested in U.S.-based investors. Uh, just a sidebar for a second, uh, 10 years ago, it was orthodoxy among VCs that they only invested in founders who worked close by, as in, in Silicon Valley. A few years ago, uh, partly in response to the globalization of the startup ecosystem and the rising costs of deals at home, more VCs started hitting the road for China, Southeast Asia, Latin America. Uh, so that was a little bit of a trend, not a, uh, a majority trend by any means. But now that investors have broken the ice with this idea of doing deals on a Zoom call uh, out of necessity, uh, no contact investing, if you will, I think this trend is going to accelerate. VCs out of necessity are going to be less home homebound and more virtually adventurous. I hope that will be a good thing for the African startup ecosystem. Anyway, uh, back to the trends in the U.S. on the venture front. Uh, VCs are busy loading up on any company that stands to benefit from COVID factors. Telemedicine is obviously a huge one, and it was fascinating to listen to the Moby Health presentation. Um, but so is remote work, uh, remote education, 
automation and digital transformation in general. The latter is especially huge when you consider the uh, strength and power of huge companies like AWS and the Google Cloud and Microsoft Azure and many startups that are coming along. Uh, it's still very early innings on the digital transformation front. It's amazing that something like 75% of major corporations are still managing their own data centers. So needless to say, uh, all things SaaS are red hot. So how does this translate for the vibrant startup ecosystem in Africa? I'm sure there are people on this call, everyone on this call probably, uh, my co-presenters not the least, who have a far better understanding of the African ecosystem than I do. But let me make a few observations based on my experience from running TechCrunch's battlefield competitions in Nairobi in 2017 and Lagos in 2018, where we all came away impressed by the quality of the scene and the founders we encountered. One thing is clear, just to state the obvious, Africa's startup scene is very real, deepening fast, and here to stay. To stay. You all know that better than I do. Um, and US venture investors are beginning to understand that as well. The proof points from their standpoint are piling up week by week. Visa's partnership with M-Pesa is just one example. Andel is, uh, I think, very smart. Pivot to remote work is another. Uh, Africa, however, of course, is a long way from New York or Silicon Valley, and VCs are not the best travelers in my experience. But I think the new Zoom era uh, of founder VC relations are really going to help accelerate uh, US VC involvement in Africa. More importantly, Africa is a dynamic, vibrant, hopeful place compared to much of the world, and, and perhaps even compared to the US these days. Uh, the overall scene in Africa has growth and scale written all over it, especially when you consider the types of challenges startups are tackling that lead to strong societal gains, as well as big markets in fields like fintech and health and transportation, education and agriculture. The winners of our two startup competitions, Empath was a Ugandan medical startup, uh, which had dramatically reduced the costs of mobile uh, scanning for uh, pregnant moms. And uh, the uh, Lori Systems was a, a company out of South Africa that had done remarkable work, essentially making it much more efficient for truck drivers to take their loads from port to uh, city. So this might be fan fanciful to say, but I believe the startup model in Africa uh, and also Latin America where I've done some work is going to eclipse the old government to government economic development aid model in terms of its beneficial impacts. Um, at the same time, despite all of that uh, very hopeful news, the startup system is still not a self-sustaining powerhouse. That takes years to develop. Outside capital remains important at all stages for startups eager to raise rounds and foreign markets, whether acquirers or stock markets are critical for exits. So what does this mean in the era of COVID and global instability? Because I think we have to put those two ideas together if we're thinking about money uh, in the big picture. And for now, I, I think uh, we're in familiar territory, so we're in a fairly reasonable place. Uh, the unforeseen consequences haven't really arrived. Capital is comparatively cheap. LPs are eager to fund VCs who can fund, find great startups. The same capital is cheap theme uh, plays to everyone's advantage when it comes to exits. There are strong and positive market factors driving acquisitions and IPOs. So the prescription of the moment, uh, I think for founders, is if you've got a shot at a good exit, exit now. If you can raise money, raise now and raise as much as you can. Work the markets hard while they are stable. And the prescription for down the road is, I think, brace for disaster. Uh, be prepared for tough times and be sure you're building a business that can sustain itself and not dry out on a, on a lack of capital that might arise in the future. It's hard to know what shape these hard times will take but it'll be a miracle if the US and the West in general have a soft landing in the current climate. So sorry to end on a slightly negative note, but I think it's a realistic one. No, I, realism is appreciated in these settings. I think um, in my experience as a business reporter and based in East Africa, but covering much of the continent, um, I think a narrative of entrepreneurship that connects very nicely with resilience, doing more with less, dynamism that is obvious to anyone who's actually paying attention to how African societies and economies work. But there is also a kind of underbelly to, um, you know, working without a safety net, um, which is common for many entrepreneurs, government, shout to Mark and MasterCard, where people, you know, they don't have friends and fools to go to for their angel rounds. They don't have a credit card to max out while they kind of bootstrap something. And so entrepreneurship in an African context 
is both something we're very proud of, but also something that's unusually precarious. I think, you know, when the world sneezes, Africa gets a cold. This is also true for COVID. Um, and so it's, I was thrilled to hear you say that some of, one of my biggest grievances about the startup investment space in Africa is how it's just doesn't have access to people who are based in California and can't be bothered to get on a plane. No offense. It's um, true. So it's amazing that we're now seeing contactless investment. I would love for that to be something that it goes from temporary to durable because I think, you know, the opportunities are, are there, but the access is not. And so if people are able to, if not get on a plane, at least open their mind to connecting to someone who might not be in the same time zone, I think that's an incredible legacy um, for this very tragic moment we find ourselves in. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit um, more about, um, I guess, what I'll call the like medium term because you've given great advice if you're a startup looking to raise right now, do it, <laughs> get the money. <laughs> People are looking for places to put capital now that interest rates are low and it's very uncertain. In the long run, I think it's a reasonable thesis that Africa is, as you said, is a place where growth and scale are, are obvious, where the, you know, you've got a billion people, many developing new internet habits. Um, but in the medium term, <laughs> particularly given COVID, no one knows what the next two to three years look like. So for exits, um, which seems to be something the VC community loves to see in order to back course, future yeah. lookalikes, um, but other kind of realization events, like what is the medium term outlook? Is it something we can't know? Um, will it be different from America, do you think? Um, or will it be just a global recession that affects everyone in the medium term? Well, I, I think the you know, financial markets are, are in a really peculiar state. And, and I don't know if anybody really has much of a crystal ball on our current circumstances. So I think there's a lot of fear of runaway inflation. Um, in the West, we haven't really uh, encountered serious inflation for really almost two generations. And um, nobody's quite uh, got their heads wrapped around what this might mean. On the other hand, you know, uh, countries like Japan that have had similar uh, uh, problems with the collapse of um, uh, values in, in real estate and, and all kinds of equity holdings did not see the inflation that a lot of people predicted. So it's, it's very, very hard to know. But I think, you know, what, if there were a kind of policy objective that I would, I would say is incumbent on, on big African countries that have already got a pretty good um, capital position, Nigeria not the least, is that the faster the internal capital markets develop, the safer the startup scene is going to be. Um, I think that that's uh, a, a capacity that's there. Um, we talked a little bit at the outset, Dio, about, you know, is the world going to become more interconnected or less interconnected? And I, I think that's really in the balance here. And, um, you know, to the extent that there's a a sort of uber policy maker in any of these countries um, thinking about the importance of the startup world, it would be interesting to kind of do the exercise of how, how much more self-sustaining can we make this? How much can we reduce our dependence on the outside world? It would be such a shame if uh, economic setbacks in the West led to some kind of a, a failure of confidence or just a shortage of funds in a place like Africa when uh, this impact and, and benefit of the startup scene is so already so profound and, and exciting. Yeah, so I guess um, one question to close is, you know, we're talking about Africa. It's something that I struggled with in writing my book, um, how to talk about a continent of people that most of whom we haven't met. Um, but then I look at the way people think about investing in the European Union or in the United States, big markets, lots of people, is that something that's handicapping Africa um, as a region? The fact that there is linguistic differentials and regulatory differentials, how, how, how much of that is preventing the kind of major deals that you see in, in other parts of the world? I, I just think there are too many uh, people in the United States who are unfamiliar with and uncomfortable with um, uh, learning Africa because Africa is an enormous topic. It's an enormous region, as you said. It's the kind of place that you really need to spend a lifetime uh, thinking and living uh, in order to <clears throat> have any semblance of an understanding. So it's easy to go to Paris or Berlin 
uh, it's tougher to go to uh, parts of Africa and, and really learn what's going on. So I think that that's the gap to close. Um, I, I, there are some brave investors who are so happy that they've not learned Africa so much as they've made friends and business associates and now they have flow in Africa. It's, it's tremendously exciting. Um, that's the key thing, I think, is to get the people interested. Um, right okay. now, it's well, a trickle. Well, then I'm going to put this back to you as a challenge, Ned, because you have done great work as TechCrunch. You're a well-respected um, Silicon Valley must-read. Do more. You guys have been doing a lot, but I do think that this is important. The stories we tell, the things we familiarize, it's the, a moment of opportunity actually right now. People are at home, people are willing to do a Zoom with anyone. Um, I think we can all collectively do more to advocate um, for the ecosystem of entrepreneurship in Africa. Thank you for already doing your part and in advance for the work you will keep doing. Thanks so much, Dio. Um, so up next, we are going to um, pass to Wambura Kimunyo. Um, who is going to speak a little bit about the education sector um, and how the situation for um, continuous learning, um, whether very young children who are in school age or, or lifelong learning that we're seeing from YouTube and other platforms like it, um, have changed under COVID. So I will pass it to you, uh, Wambura, and, and do let us know um, uh, how you'd like to take the Q&A forward. I'll ask a few questions and Hopefully we'll get insights from your slides. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dio. Um, I think everybody is um, repeating what you said at the beginning, which is that these are unprecedented times. Um, and especially for the ed tech sector, we had a very interesting time beginning mid-March um, here in Africa. Um, we're a nascent sector as ed tech compared, for example, to a sector like FinTech. And um, I read somewhere that somebody talked about um, it being a litmus test for us, but I prefer the notion of a, um, a pilot, a continental global pilot or whatever you want to call it, because that, um, that view carries the, um, the notion of taking feedback. After, um, from mid-March, we had about 253 million children out of school. Um, you'll see that most of those, just because of um, people who leave the school pipeline, uh, through the years. The bulk of those are in primary school, but there are also 8 million at the tertiary level who were out of the school system because of um, COVID. And um, you'll see that it also affected the entire um, continent for the, for the most part. There were some partial closings in Ethiopia and Nigeria, and there was um, some countries um, like Equatorial Guinea and uh, Burundi where they didn't close, but all other um, African countries all schools were closed. And in this context, when you think about those numbers, kids, um, learners went back home um, and there was the wrestling with how do we continue learning? And the context also included this realities that uh, your cheapest internet device right now um, costs about 68.5% of your average monthly income and um, data about 6.8% of um, average monthly income according to GSMA and only 33% of Africans have um, access to um, a smartphone and most importantly and I think this is this is particularly important to me because um, the, the divide between rural and urban um, access first of all to mobile internet but also men and women and this the men and women divide is actually quite important because we carried out a survey and we found out that 60% of the children who are learning on um, mobile devices are learning on their mother's mobile devices. Um, so basically we see, um, in reality, I know that there's, um, there's a big idea about um, how technology responded, how people responded uh, leveraging technology, um, but uh, from our observation, um, we saw a hierarchy of responses, and by hierarchy, I mean um, at the bottom are the responses that reached the most people and therefore had the highest impact. Um, um, broadcast technology was used, has been used by all, almost all governments that I've um, had the opportunity to ask about or interact with. They've mostly moved to radio lessons just because of the ubiquity of, the, of, of radio. It's a one-way um, channel, but it, um, it served. And then you had SMS and basic mobile technology, which again um, is 
because 90% of households have access to a basic mobile phone that was highly used. And then on top of that, then a few, few are those who have access to a basic smartphone and have some knowledge of how to use technology, widely used social apps. In fact, this has been most widely used um, in small numbers, right? So you have schools, teachers teaching um, or organizing their uh, classes via WhatsApp into classes and sending videos sometimes to their students and then um, what's it called? Notes, instructions about how to um, continue to learn. And then lastly, your top 10% are people who have access, uh, clear access to the internet and could continue to use, um, to learn directly online. They moved from, on Friday, uh, schools were closed on Monday, they moved online and got through with learning using the internet as a pipe via Zoom teams. So there was an entire, there was a, a, a slice of Africa that continued completely like that, that, like the rest of the world. And these were all the basic responses. I will go to the next slide and just quickly um, just mention that the ecosystem of players had very many different um, reactions. Um, for, le for learners, there's ways in which um, there's a risk of exacerbating the disparities in access to education for uh, learners who had devices versus those who didn't have devices. I think that's a question that shall remain um, on our minds as the situation um, improves and people go back to school. Um, I will just highlight for governments um, that they've had to grapple with the question of how to provide access and create an equitable environment for learning. And that's at the very basic level, electricity grid, um, internet infrastructure, ETC. But it also, I think uh, the governments have been more open to um, enhance opportunities for public uh, private partnerships, which I think is a good thing. Um, teachers have been compelled in one way or another to accelerate the adoption of technology. Um, they've just had to, if they wanted to continue to interact with their students. And it's, some, for that, some it's been a difficult journey, but you can see movement, even for those who uh, are laggards. And for parents, parents, uh, I think we all know, have been uh, forced, uh, circumstances forced, has, have forced them to be more engaged with children's learning. And um, I think that that has uh, good implications for the future. And just one last slide with the, with the issues, and you can read them there. Um, the emerging issues are, 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 there are a number of them, but I think the ones I wanted to highlight were um, ongoing conversations about the quality of online learning versus on-site in-person learning. I think that's a global conversation and in Africa is also in that conversation. Um, creating an enabling environment for, um, to, to flatten access to internet um, and digital technologies. Um, and then in our sector as EdTech, just um, a question of sustainability of EdTech ventures, because we can see a huge demand. The question is whether that demand is accompanied by a willingness to pay and, and ways of um, receiving payments, um, especially micropayments. Yep. And lastly, the importance of equipping and empowering teachers. There you go. Thank you. This is extremely important and really very thoughtfully and concisely communicated the scope of the challenge. I certainly gasped when I saw that statistic of 253 million students out of school, all of whom the continent is going to depend on to build its 21st century future. Yes. And so this is of paramount importance. One of the things that has come to the fore globally as people think through how we might emerge from the crisis, both from an economic standpoint and just from a practical standpoint and public health standpoint is the role of essential workers, right? And defining and redefining what essential work means. And something that I've been really interested in is understanding the relationship between caregiving, um, education, um, and the economy, where it seems like the one very clearly supports the other, but very often it's not considered as important or as an input to the economic development of a society. This stuff is seen very starkly in the disinvestment that African governments have made in education over the years, and also in the rise of private alternatives, whether it's religious schools or mom and pop operations, or you know, new companies like your own. 
This is a, a topic I explored in my book at a chapter about youth in the future of Africa. But I'm very curious as to whether you see this conversation that you have changing to really understand the importance of education as infrastructure. <laughs> um, whether people are now starting to realize the importance of this given the crisis or whether we're still in the same deprioritization, I suppose, um, as in the past? Um, I think, I think that um, there's a sense, my, my sense has always been that education um, is still seen in Africa. We, I, I say that there's two things in Africa that, uh, that Africans value, land and um, education. And yep. educa both of them are value, right? Education delivers value in the future. And I, you can see that in the conversations people are having now about how to ensure that kids are not left behind, right? What do we do to, um, to continue to deliver learning and um, to continue to advance um, students through um, your educational system despite the fact that you do not have in-person learning? So I'm a bit optimistic in terms of um, what this because a lot of questions have been raised, right, through this time. How do you continue to deliver learning in this new context? And um, our sector and other sectors, the governments, parents, everybody's trying to answer this question. Um, but I think that in terms of um, commitment and an understanding that this is, is, is an important question before all of us, I, I see that there's a lot of agreement that this must yeah. sit at the table. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's hard not to agree, but you know, when you see where the, the rubber meets the road, where the budgets go, sometimes you wonder where the priorities lie. Um, so my other question, I guess, is maybe just around um, not the proliferation of the sort of private or public experiences, but really like who is taking ownership over the provision of those services and paying for them in some way? Um, will it be governments via budgets? Will it be via non-governmental organizations, whether national or international? Or will it be parents paying what they can afford um, to give their kids experiences that they, that they want them to have? Who pays? Baba meets the road, I, because um, yes, um, the trick with education, I don't think it's just in Africa, but um, the government plays a big role in financing education. So what we found is, as I mentioned, that um, there's a lot of innovation um, taking place, or at least questions about what to build next. Um, but um, who will pay is still up in the air. And that is what, um, unfortunately, will end up exacerbating differences. Because parents who, have, parents, parents who have means will be able to pay for the very best. But you do not want to leave the bulk of um, children behind um, in, in, in the process. And there's been some interesting um, advances, at least. Uh, for example, I like that uh, in Rwanda, um, there's a conversation about getting a smart device into every home. Yeah. For reasons such as this, because then you, you know that um, they have a sense that you, you drive some equality there and then you can, you can sort of yeah. move. And it may be that, okay, so the public sector will take on that second bullet in your slide, the enabling environment, which is what they might do for all kinds of economic growth. But if you provide good uh, in broadband infrastructure and reasonable access, and that covers uh, many sectors, but it also helps education. Yes. So thank you again, Wambura, for your time. Um, look forward to seeing you in next time in KE. Um, next, we're gonna go to Makano Mosidi. Yeah. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for inviting me just to share some insights. And uh, so to your earlier um, um, poll, I think I found it most interesting in terms of the outcomes because it just confirms the number of things that one feels are going to actually endure beyond the COVID-19. So just as an introduction, I mean, the, if, if any one of us in this audience does a simple Google check on 2020 technology trends, we will all without doubt come back with artificial intelligence, we'll come back with uh, internet of things, we'll come back with uh, robotics or blockchain or uh, deep learning or machine learning. 
which is quite good and fair. And I think truly those technologies are trending. We don't know if they'll endure, but right now it's what everybody's talking about. But I've chosen to actually share with this audience just our life experiences because of COVID. And out of that experience, I think the kind of technologies that I think we will actually enjoy, some of them are a surprise to me because they've just been there since the beginning of time. Some of them are fairly new and we see the advantage of those. So I have taken COVID as a gift because um, that lockdown presented to us and share what's been presented to us some opportunities to, to test some of the things that probably we wouldn't have done at all. So there, I thought I'll, I'll just pick on those technologies mm -hmm. and explain how we, we leveraged on them and how we found some value in terms of consuming them. And the first one, uh, which is a pretty old tech that has always been there, which is connectivity. Um, I think it just came to the fore when we had three weeks to get over 50,000 employees to work from home and to be able to enable them to communicate within a secure environment and to be able to continue servicing clients and giving them that superior service that the clients would like to have. And just for us to be able to do that, I think it was a first. It's good always to talk about, oh yes, we should actually be able to work remotely. But just at this point, I think it was a must. It was a burning platform and we had to actually mobilize and make sure that people can work and they can actually continue giving a service. So we're not necessarily ready to do that. However, if I look at the software-driven networks, those networks which are intelligent, which can actually respond to the traffic sizes and the traffic criticalities, I think that is the first critical success factor that anyone would like to have going forward as well, especially if we have to tap into those new markets and new geographies and those remote areas that should actually form part of the economy. So I think in my view, connectivity, networking, intelligent networks, those have become like a basic service. And I think it's a travesty if people don't have connectivity to be able just to be active in the economy. Mm -hmm. um, so I think for my place of work, like I mentioned earlier, it was really about making sure that we get over 50,000 people working. But firstly, I mean, it had to be a secure environment. So I think all those good things that we probably might have not been as strong, they actually came to the fore. So connectivity, ability to actually communicate remotely and work remotely, that was the first uh, point. And I think that technology should continue and we should continue advancing our communications network. We should continue making them more intelligent, more responsive and more secure. The second one, I think, is just in terms of what we call digital channels. Because when we engage, when we, we, we actually get our clients interacting with us, when we get our clients engaging with us, and when they transact with us, and, and I'm more on the corporate side of things in the bank, I think that interaction, because it's mostly FaceTime, but we have seen now in terms of the trends, is beginning to be more digitized. So each and every organization is working on digitizing their operations and we are no different. The digitization of our channels was accelerated and there was a definite increase in the number of clients who used those channels mm -hmm. because it provided a safe environment, it provided a secure environment where they could do it without having to be subjected to the risk of the virus. Yeah. What we saw I mean, the uptake and the uptick in the volumes, in the number of those di digital interactions, they more than doubled. And the convenience to our client was evident in those increased volumes. Um, I want to talk to you as a, a business leader working within an organization. 
because I think that is one of the more salient aspects of how you have been reacting to this environment and probably pretty helpful for a lot of the people who are on this call who are maybe themselves in a business leadership role, trying to figure out how to adapt and above all, trying to understand how important technology is to their future. On the one hand, this is a moment where getting scrappy, doing more with less is essential. Um, all of us who are taking our phone calls from our living rooms and our bedrooms know this. On the other hand, this is an opportunity to leapfrog and to really make sure that as customers turn to these digital channels, that your digital channels work. The user experience is great, that you're learning, getting feedback and building for success in a future that may not include a pandemic, but will have this digital aspect to it that remains. So my question for you as a leader, and maybe as advice to those who are business leaders themselves or operating within businesses, how do you prioritize your tech investment, your tech debt um, over keeping the lights on, keeping your people paid, making sure your marketing is still connecting to people, um, and how do you see those trade-offs um, in a moment like this? So, Dayo, I think yeah, that is a life of a business leader like myself in terms of how you, you should continue to prioritize, how you should continue to make sure that you do what is important. But firstly, maybe let me comment and say there is no tech without people. Okay? Mm -hmm. so, and there is no tech for its own self or for its own sake. So depending on what we'd like to drive, and from, from where I'm coming from, what I'd like to drive is really those experiences that our clients should have to actually increase the share of the wallet to make sure that we drive the economies and we accelerate the economies. I think the prioritization will be largely driven by what we, we do to enable our clients to make sure that they can actually enjoy and interact with us in a manner that that is actually making sense to them, not so much in a manner that the bank operates, but more about you know, what they would like to express the bank as, for example. Mm -hmm. So the prioritization of tech is more about what is easily consumable by people and what will actually accelerate that interaction and that, uh, that uh, engagement that we usually have with our clients and those who engage with. And today, when you think about the ecosystem economy that you are in, the collaborative way that we work, I suppose you want those technologies that are open, that are not necessarily proprietary, that will actually allow you to start building indigenous products and platforms that will help you to accelerate your own economies and the nuances of your own geographies. So I think in terms of that prioritization, we should look at those things that will be development, developmental in nature, that will accelerate our economy and actually make sure that as people engage, as people continue to, draw, to grow their economies, they can actually tap into those technologies, but not only to tap, but also to also manufacture those that they can consume themselves. Today, when we look at the collaborative platforms that have actually fueled the, 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 the engagements and that have actually grown because of the COVID pan pandemic, we see that those collaborative platforms have been very central to how we actually engage and how we continue to engage. So I think looking at where we are now, everything that we do, we should actually be open enough to see if you can actually even collaborate with your competitors to create value along the value chain. And that is why it's a platform driven economy now. So let's not close ourselves up, but more to open ourselves to working and collaborating and co-creating value and co-developing value with everybody along the value chain in whatever market or industry that you'd like to have. Um, I think this is really key. Your response is really um, enlightening and inspiring because it's one that's led by the customer, right? Um, you know, at Standard Bank, you're relentlessly focused on the end user, whether it's a user of financial services or the user of a technology. And so if you can focus on making that person thrive as a KPI, you can have that be marketing, you can have that be your IT department, you can have that be point of sale. All of those people are gonna be focused on the customer. So that's a really good lesson and reminder for all of us um, who are really trying to make it in Africa, whatever our sector, being focused on delivering a good experience for people is, is paramount. Um, the other question I guess I have is, for, again, I'm going to leave this in the realm of kind of organizational behavior because we haven't gotten to talk about it as much. Um, 
But how are you managing teams in this environment? How are people, I mean, I, I really heard you when you said, you know, you don't have tech without people. I feel that when I have meetings like this, I try to ask people how they're doing, but how are you managing throughout this swirl to keep people prioritized, to give people the space they need to deal with and react with what is a, an absolutely crazy moment and of a lot of uncertainty and, and stress for people? So that I think firstly, the role of a leader is more to inspire, yeah. to lead, to create a conducive environment for people that work with you so that you can actually achieve greatness together. So that is the first part, whether it's during the, the lockdown, whether it's during the difficult times, I think a leader must actually rise above and lead and inspire and encourage people to do that. However, given the industry that we're in, given the digital era that you're actually operating in now, I suppose it's also important to create an environment where people can reinvent themselves. I do believe that this time, this era, uh, is for us to reinvent and to start interacting differently and learning to interact with the technology. So how do you do it then with a team that you have? Create that in conducive environment. Make sure that you have the learning platforms that people can actually self reinvent as well and be encouraged to do it. If you look at um, my backyard, the chief executive himself is leading a challenge in terms of Trailhead. Trailhead is an online Salesforce uh, training platform. And he's saying, guys, I have a thousand badges now. And he's the chief executive. So he's inspiring us to actually go ahead and consume different things, to start consuming those platforms. Please, those audience, people. those of you who are in the middle of this very big challenge for businesses and leaders, let's come back to this because I, I don't want to deprioritize not just what we're doing, but how we are doing it. And, and I really appreciate your thoughts on this, Makano. And uh, we'll move on to our, our last um, discussant and then Teresa will be leading an open Q&A. So prepare your questions on all of these very inspiring, interesting topics. Um, Alyssa, please take it away. You are working with Uber Eats um, in a Pan-African sense. And uh, I know you guys have had some very interesting M&A uh, just announced this past week where uh, Uber is investing in Postmates. But let's hear the perspective from the Sub-Saharan region. Um, and thank you again for being here with us. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me and for the very um, capture, in capturing session so far. I think it's incredible to hear how many similarities there are across industries and how much is happening quite similarly from you know, team focus to customer obsession across our industries on the continent. Um, so maybe just kind of who is Ubi Eats on the continent, just for perspective. So Ubi Eats is in 6,000 cities in the world, but we're in 12 cities uh, across two countries in sub-Saharan Africa, that being both Kenya um, and South Africa. And we've partnered with thousands of restaurants um, and courier, couriers across both of these countries. And I think the pandemic really um, took us by surprise in these, in the, in an, in the African or the sub-Saharan African context, uh, based on the reactions by both governments on how we would approach food delivery. So when, um, when, it, when we started as both countries to go into to different versions of lockdown, in South Africa, a decision was taken to actually close restaurants altogether for the first stage of our lockdown. And in Kenya, we had very limited operating hours. And so we saw an immediate impact of the application in its closure in South Africa and in terms of its ability to access people because of this limitation of curfew hours in, in Kenya. And the first thing we had to ask ourselves was, how do we adapt? And I think we had a number of partners that we felt incredibly responsible to, um, being our restaurants and our couriers, and it was important for us to adapt as quickly as we could. And so we did two key things. One, we introduced a product called Uber Direct, um, which is a B2B um, delivery solution. So an, a last mile delivery solution that we hadn't had in South Africa um, or Kenya before. And we really um, were quite scrappy in making sure that we were able to launch this as quickly as possible to get couriers and drivers on the road. Um, and then we realized that people were at home and needed access to essential items, but were obviously fearful of leaving their households. And so we quickly introduced an essential service delivery um, service, really delivering everything from groceries through to uh, pet food, depending on what people needed. 
What was interesting is like starting to understand the scope of new things that could be delivered using the technology. Um, and so some of the things that we introduced were things like um, exclusive books, which is a book uh, retailer in South Africa and understanding that people were at home, their kids were at home and they were really struggling to manage those dynamics, introducing new things that we could bring to people in their comfort of their home where their mobility was limited. What we were super cognizant of was how could we, in, how could we be conscious of what the consumer was um, experiencing and, and change the dynamics of how people interacted. And so I think there were two things. One was really about bringing safety into the application. So ensuring that we obviously complied with World Health Organization requirements, but really that people felt safe. Um, and to your question earlier, or your thought earlier on like what will stay um, in terms of how we interact post this COVID world. I think this is one of the things where people are now um, a little bit more conscious about their, their various interactions. And so things like um, enhancing our safety and, our, and food hygiene requirements was absolutely fundamental. And introducing things like contactless delivery, et cetera, really helped people feel safe. The other thing we realized was people couldn't see each other like they could. And so something like introducing the ability for consumers to share their deliveries with their loved ones so that they could send food to each other or send a book to someone that you love during this time um, was particularly meaningful. Yes, I love that. I love yeah. people send rides. Like I would often be like, pick up my auntie and drop her off somewhere. I didn't realize people were using this to send food, food from one exactly. person to another. Love exactly. that. Love that and, innovation. <laughs> and I think, um, I, I, you know, very true to the African conti continent, we often show our love with food. And so I think this, um, this small nuance to adapt to kind of where people were uh, was a very, was an innovation that I was particularly excited about. One of yeah. the other things we were watching super carefully is like, what's happening to consumer behavior? So obviously people are staying at home a lot more, but what's happening to the choices that they're making, their ordering behavior, and how do we adapt very caref quickly to that? And so we started to really look at the data that was available, started to see that, you know, there was an 82% increase in search for healthy food on the application. And we started to change our selection to ensure that we adapted to what the consumer needed. And so I think using that data um, that we had available was super important for us um, to make sure that the, the app continued to be re relevant throughout um, um, this, this pandemic. I think what happened, you know, obviously we reopened the, the application to, to um, provide the full suite of, of services, including food delivery once restaurants were reopened. Um, and I think we saw a surge in demand. Uh, oh, I know that we saw a surge in demand and it's really about, is this, is this here to stay or is this something that's very um, transitionary based on the circumstances? And what yeah. we see, particularly in South Africa, is that 70% of um, surveyed users, uh, surveyed people in, in South Africa are turning to e-commerce. And the second thing that we're seeing is the need for something reliable and now has increased. Um, and so, you know, Nielsen has done a study re a re uh, recently which said that consumers want to maintain the habits um, that, they've, that they've experienced over this COVID period. So I will ask a question here, which is that Uber Eats operates a two-sided marketplace, right? You have end users who are trying to buy, and then you also have businesses that are using your platform to connect. And then I guess you have delivery people. So exactly. um, each of them represents a consumer to obsess over. All of them have surely changed their behaviors under lockdown. How have you guys made sure you're taking care of each of these stakeholders um, with regards to safety, maybe for drivers, um, and building a new platform for people who might not have thought that Uber Eats was for them as a distribution channel? Talk to us about your three different stakeholders, I guess. 100%. So absolutely a three-sided marketplace and something very careful that we need to balance in terms of understanding all of the needs. I think from a courier standpoint, what was fundamental for us was getting couriers on the road, driving earning opportunities. So um, that is obviously very real in a world where we work in a gig economy and a number of our couriers are not employees. And as a result, we need to ensure that they have an earning uh, and economic opportunity, which might not be available um, when the application is closed. So that was a first and foremost. The second, to, exactly to your point, is protecting safety. And I think when you talk safety, often people, what comes to the forefront is, 
you know, are the consumers face a safe on drop off? And I think one of the things that was very important to us was helping ensure that the couriers were equally safe um, when on the road and interacting with multiple partners. And so we work very closely with our restaurants to um, monitor temperature, help with education. And then we used our tech to help um, for example, every time a courier comes online, he needs to take a selfie um, to show that he's wearing a face mask to ensure that he's complying with the, with the local regs. So really um, using technology very quickly um, to ensure that um, we could protect the safety of all the people in the marketplace and contactless delivery, as much as it's protecting the consumer, is actually ensuring that the courier has um, fewer contacts um, because he leaves the food at your door, takes a picture and, and steps away. So, so we Sorry to interrupt you. I'm realizing we have very little time left. Will you keep no worries. these new types of businesses that are not restaurants on your platform after lockdown and after COVID? Absolutely. What we've also seen is, so absolutely, I think we're seeing that the consumer has a strong demand for it. And we haven't seen a shift, a downward shift in that demand, um, you know, as lockdown has kind of eased up um, in both South Africa and Kenya. In fact, what we're seeing is people using Uber Eats as a, um, for small to medium enterprises, it's an opportunity to get a route to market. And so we're starting to see more and more things like dark kitchens, uh, virtual spaces coming on onto the application um, as people are looking for new opportunities to generate revenue. That is super interesting. And you can imagine an opportunity to build more functionality for non-restaurants to really demonstrate what they sell. Um, maybe not a threat to a traditional e-commerce, but an African version from an American company operating in a very weird context, which is, I guess, what we like to see. Um, I am told that we have, oh, we have one minute left. Okay, so I guess my other question for you um, really was looking at the global Uber Eats, you know, the M&A of a big, scary American business coming in and um, adapting for Africa, as we've seen. But how do you think about sending back what you've learned to kind of global um, and the unique experiences you've talked about in running this business and this time as being a way to show how you might leapfrog or adapt or are these just again individual local businesses or are we going somewhere new together um so i think what's actually a fundamental value of uber is um living locally and thinking globally so using all the great like um, thought leadership that we have from being a global community, but ensuring that we hyper local in, in the way that we operate. And so um, exactly some of the challenges that we see in South Africa, which was like one of three countries who closed food delivery right through to, um, you know, a Kenya where M-Pesa is such a fundamental payment me mechanic and ensuring that we customize. Those are things that we work very closely with our global organization on ensuring that we prioritize the adaptation of the application to be relevant to Africa. Um, and I think we continue to see um, from a global standpoint how, um, how Uber has prioritized Africa as a continent uh, for growth. And, I, and I'm, I'm looking forward to us seeing that continue even as Uber Eats grows across the continent. Okay. Well, I don't know if we can break news today if you can tell us if there's gonna be any more acquisitions. I will leave that to Ned, but I'm very interested to see because I think that that space in general has been a real bright spot, I think, for entrepreneurship in the food sector in Africa and many different countries. Um, I think we are out of time. I'm gonna pass it over to Teresa, who's gonna give us some closing remarks and lead the public Q&A, but you guys have been amazing. I've learned so much. I'm glad this is being recorded and we can keep learning from it. Um, please take it away, Teresa. Thank you very much. And Dio, thank you for your excellent moderation of this discussion. You've done a fantastic job taking us through uh, this topic and through a large number of panelists today. So um, thank you. Well, I think uh, the overarching theme I've heard from everybody is that we're now moving to tactless everything. And the pressure to reimagine how our industries function in an environment where we have this hard constraint is simply a replication of some of the big structural economic constraints Africa has always had to deal with. And so really the rest of the world is catching up to what it's like to operate with one hand tied behind your back. Um, and so to all of you who are running businesses and enterprises in Africa successfully, those of you in the audience who are doing the same, kudos to you. You are already better prepared for what's happening now than most <laughs> businesses over the world. But it's also great to have the specific detail from what is happening with telemedicine, 
getting wide open um, to the reinforced um, need to invest in education for young people, um, to really thinking through how investment is going to change and may actually be something transformative for the continent. I have been inspired by everyone's story. Um, and I hope that more people will start to take the lessons we've learned from what you guys are doing, apply them to what their regional opportunities uh, may be, and that we kind of keep seeing a flywheel again so that this isn't just um, a temporary crisis that we survived, but something we learned from and built on so we could thrive um, as a community of people who care about Africa, who care about African business, who care about doing world-beating, world-leading um, technological innovation. Um, I think that, um, you know, you never want to let a crisis go to waste. And it does not seem like anyone is doing that. So thank you for your efforts. Um, and um, I look forward to following this story. So thank I you again. Yes, I, I really, as I said, we love all of our sessions, but this one I found to be particularly interesting. And um, I'd like to thank all of the panelists uh, for bringing your insights to us. And I'm going to ask you right now if maybe you can come back in six months so we can see which of these trends have endured and see what we said today, uh, how much of it came true and, and how much has changed. So thank you for, for your time. Um, I want to just wrap up here um, by first acknowledging all of our media partners who help us get the word out and we'll be reporting on this. Um, these slides and uh, the whole videos will be available on demand on virtualconferenceafrica.com. I want to thank our sponsors, um, Standard Bank, for being with us from the very beginning. Our silver sponsors are FSDH Merchant Bank, Main One out of Nigeria, and the Trade and Development Bank out of East Africa. Our bronze sponsors are Covington, and today we welcome for the first time uh, Mark Elliott and MasterCard. Um, thank you for supporting this effort. We very much appreciate it. I want to remind everybody that next week we will be welcoming Melinda Gates. She will be with us next Thursday. And she will be talking about um, a report that is going to be uh, published next week. Please tune back in next week for this discussion with Melinda Gates. Thank you all again for just a truly fascinating conversation. Ned, Makuno, Mark, Umbara, Alyssa, Fumi, and Dayo for moderating. It's a wrap. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone.